Welcome to the Effects Loop, keeping you in the loop of the guitar community. I'm Diaz. I'm Chris. I'm Marissa. And I'm Scott. And uh, this week, we are brought to you by Lambertone Pickups. Um, they sent us in a set of their PAF humbuckers called the Lacramas to demo. Hopefully, we'll be getting that out about the same time that this episode is dropping. Um, this week, we are focusing on the topic of the new PRS Silver, was it Silver Sky? Uh, the John Mayer Strat. So the PRS oh, Strat. S type guitar. S S type <laughs> guitar. That thing is a Strat if I've ever seen one. So I know that uh, quite a few of us have opinions on it. We're going to start with my favorite one. Scott, go for it. <laughs> well, uh, being the admitted John Mayer fanboy in the group, um, I want to try it. I'm excited but about it. The thing that like kills me though is I, I I mentioned this before is like it's an S style body but like weren't most PRSs just S styles with a carved top or was I like seeing something that no one else was seeing? I I thought the story behind it was Paul Reed Smith took like the Les Paul the Strat and tried to average the two of them together. Yeah, it looks like a Strat and a Les Paul had a baby. Yeah, and uh, so this is a little more straight up fendery, but you know I like that bottom horn carve. I mean, the, that before. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm looking at it now, so. Oh, yeah, I've got it pulled up. I can't stop looking at it. See, I love it, too. I think the the main thing is that it's like an actual Strat. It's not like they really, like, took a Strat and made it something that no one would actually want which a lot of companies have been doing that. That's like some of these boutique brands that are like, they're like, oh, well, we don't want it to look the same as, you know, the Strat or the Les Paul. And it's like, yeah, your Strat, it looks like a Strat just on acid. But, and the price point's pretty good too. It's what, twenty two ninety nine. Sounds right. Which is actually for a PRS, not a horrible price. That's right there in the, I mean, that's in between the CE and the Starla and price all- range, isn't it? Four hundred dollars more than the Fender Professional American Professional series. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I love Fenders. I've got uh, the Atelier Deluxe, and uh, but Paul Reed Smith's guitars are one of those where you just you pick up every single one and they all feel great. And Fender just really has like their quality control's gotten a lot better, but yeah. for a while there it was hit or miss. Okay, so since you brought that point up. I'll go ahead and give half of my opinion on this. Do you think this is just a, like, one of the nicer Strat copies on the mark, like, name brand Strat copies? Or do you think this is going to be, like, on par with a top of the line Fender? Uh, I think it's going to be, it'll probably be on par with top of the line Fender. Maybe a little bit better because, I mean, the thing about this is Paul Reed Smith's really good about taking a design and finding, uh, like, the things that you don't realize are bugging you about it. Um, I really want to see the, the tremolo system on this because that has been a hit or miss for strats for a while, um, depending on what tremolo system's on it and how it works, if it stays in tune. Yeah. So I th- I think that's a big thing is how that works and also the pickups because Paul Reed Smith pretty much every guitar they put out the pickups sound great Fender once again not so much they kind of go whichever way um, but the one thing I want to know is because uh, John Mayer's Strat the real money in them or like the sweet spot was the Big Dipper pickups mm-hmm. Scott you've got the the John Mayer Strat, don't you? I do, and I play that thing like a lot. Yeah, I love that thing, the way it's. And sounds. you've got the big, the big dipper pickups, right? Oh yeah. Like that's where the money's at in them. I mean, the body, I mean, it's a great feeling body. But the one thing that was special about that guitar that was different than all the other Strats out there was those pickups for the most part. Yeah, I mean, the the other real big difference was it was a pretty thick C shaped neck. So it's it's way chunkier than like my made in Mexico strat that I parts castered, I don't know, a year or two ago. Uh 
it's really thick. The frets are a bit different than your typical Strat. So you kind of, you don't get a very low action on it and you just kind of, you just hit it hard and bend a lot. And it's, it's a fun guitar to play like hard. If that makes sense. Yeah. It didn't, uh, um, it, I, when I played one, it reminded me of the uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan signature. Well, it, I think that's the story behind John Mayer's is that he bought a Stevie Ray Vaughan that was broken. Like the yeah. pickups were messed up and that's how you kind of got that unique sound. And then they kind of created a, a custom, you know, recreation of it. But those pickups do I not output very much though. Like they're a very quiet pickup. So with this new PRS, how they're ta all talking about the signal to noise on them and their hotter output. I, I think that's probably going to be the big difference between that and like the John Mayer, like Fender. I really want to f see what the neck feels like. That's kind of, I don't know. I wonder if these are going to be a guitar that's like in every guitar center. I mean, for that price, I would kind of hope so. Yeah, I think they're selling this one in volume. I think they're going for that. Okay. I mean, I thought I hope so. Me. I mean, they got the, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the, and they'll be everywhere. They're already up for pre-order on Sweetwater, Z-Zounds. So they've got that nice 12-month payment plan on them, Don't. which I'm not allowed to do, Don't according do to my that. wife. <laughs> <laughs> she said I can't do it, so. Yeah, like I guarantee Chicago Music Exchange is going to have one of these on the floor. So I'm I'm hoping to get a chance to go play it. Yeah, because you're, you're like a throne stow away from them, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I'm like four train stops. <laughs> it's super easy to get there. I love how you can tell <laughs> where where I live compared to where you live because you're like four train stops, and I'm just like, what's a train? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the only trains I see are the ones that block me from crossing the road every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's city limits. I remember when I was in when we were at uh, Nam last year, and you're just like, yeah, no, no, no hop an Uber. Da, da, da. I'm just like, what's an Uber? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh man. So so wait, wait. Chris had Chris had two parts oh, did to yeah. his evaluation. Let's go so to the second part. Part one of I'm assuming this is going to be a much better quality strat. I mean, maybe on par with like the five thousand dollar, you know, custom jobs. But at the same time, if you're a brand new artist to somebody like PRS, why would you not try something a little different? Are you talking about John Mayer? Yes. No, 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 he already did. Yeah, that's yeah, Super know. Eagle's pretty uh, out there. Super Eagle pulled up, which I absolutely loved the idea of, because you had- It was like six grand? 12. Uh, oh, oh, shoot. Yeah. So to me personally, if I was going to actually see a quote unquote lower end, uh, John Mayer Sig, I would have preferred to have seen like an SE Super Eagle. That would have like completely made my day. Well, I'm I don't not know. A fan of Mayer, I'm just a fan of having like that those options on something. Well, okay, so they've got some SE signatures, but I don't think they really sell well. Well, but they also pick kind of random artists. I know the the Zach Myers sold pretty well. Um, you see those all throughout Praise and Worship. Um, the Semi Hollow one, uh, the guy from, uh, what was it, Shine Down? Um, actually, yeah. Zach Myers. Zach Myers, he's from Shine Down. And then uh, they also put out a uh, the Paul Allender. That was like one of their first signatures. That was the SE that had the bat inlays and the, it's like purple and black. And, yeah, but that's. I don't, nice metal guy so that I kind of limited that audience I think yeah and I'm trying to think if there's any other there's um, a Santana, Santana. Uh, did they have a Santana SE yeah that was like the first one was it uh, and I think there's well, a Tremonti SE as well yeah I do remember the Tremonti SE I know uh, I think does does race Bellinger he's a guy that's in a few of the groups that we're in I think he might have one I know he has a Paul Reed Smith, and he has a few SEs. So, 
But I don't know about a lower end. I mean, because if you think about it, most people you think of that listen to John Mayer are middle-aged white men who have decent paying jobs you or their wives. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Scott, how old are you? I'm, about Scott's age. I'm 30. Uh, you're not middle-aged yet, <laughs> but I'll hit 30 this year. I had that crisis earlier at church when I realized I was the, I was one of the old guys on the team. So. I'm still three years behind y'all. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 29, so... I turn 31 next month. Yeah. See, now you have to start eating Denny's at 4 p.m. and complaining about the service. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of the rules. Uh, they, uh, I don't know. I think, but they're like the target they're shooting for. I mean, that's like they came out with the Super Eagle, and I'm pretty sure most of those sold. Um, what was it? Uh, Steve Torres was working at Lark Guitars in Texas, and they had they carry all the high end PRS stuff and. They had a Super Eagle, and he listed it on Gear Talk Classifieds. And one of the guys went on there. He's like, "Who would ever pay something like that?" And he he went on like like the next day. He's like, "Up, oh, it already sold. Bye, guys." Like, <laughs> I, I mean, there's PRS is one of those companies though. They they're pretty good at knowing where they can make good money. That's like they've got the private stock. That's twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen grand, twenty grand. Yeah, they'll only make a hundred of them. I mean, like, there's that there's the whole limited quantity thing with Paul Reed Smiths, yeah. like the high end. So yeah, it's not like you buy it and suddenly it's worth eight grand after the mini ticket. Paul there. Reed, but I will say PRSs don't hold their value well. Like that's one thing. I mean, I you see a Paul Reed Smith custom twenty four ten top, it's on Craigslist for eighteen hundred. Those things are thirty or three grand, brand new, hmm. over three thirty four hundred. I mean, th that's one thing. PRS they resell val value on them is horrible. So, but yeah, I can see that being an issue. I mean, but I think in the the John Mayer ones, they're becoming an actual line. I know they've got. I think the first fifty or so come with a hard case. Everything else comes out with a soft case. I think that's the only thing that they're doing that's kind of limited on them. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, at their price point, that's not a limited edition guitar. No, I mean like uh, I mean, remember when the Fender was doing the John Mayers? The the Fender like standard one was like sixteen hundred mm -hmm. with a with that awesome gig bag, and then the, I forgot who made it. It was someone. It was in case. Was that who made it? Yeah, it was in case. Yeah, um, and then they had like the custom shop black one that had like relicking and all that. I think it was stuff. a direct copy of his blacky one, right? Yeah. And that yeah. was probably way more. I didn't even bother looking at the price. <laughs> it's probably one of those ones where it says call store for price. And you're like, I can't afford that. Yeah, it, I can't afford to call. <laughs> it, it's a bidding war between all the dentists who visit the store. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I do think it's funny. There's this gas station I go to. And every time I go to it, they're playing John Mayer. And it's in the worst part of town. Like it's, it's and every time I pull up to get gas, because it just happens to be the cheapest gas, and it's right near a place I always go. So I go and donate plasma. That's where I get a lot of my gear money. And I get I'll donate plasma, and then I'll go over and I'll put gas in my truck. And they're always playing John Mayer, and I don't understand how they get away with it. But <laughs> I mean, I sing along. <laughs> don't get me wrong. So I I, I guess the. To wrap up this topic, what are you guys' grievances against this, if any? I think Marissa has a lot of grievances against it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Marissa has, like, not even spoken. So, come on. I just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's ugly. Was it the you, what, like the headstock? Or, like... The headstock. Or do you like... just hate strats in general? Okay, remember she's a we're U two fan, so she can't hate a strat. <laughs> it only works if the edge is playing it. Yeah. No. I like strats. I just this one doesn't do anything for me. I like a guitar that's more um aesthetically pleasing. This for me just doesn't do that. See, I, I can I can agree the headstock makes or breaks it because I hate I hate the like 70s fat headstocks or whatever they are what are they called that the, the uh, cbs yeah cbs oh god those things are ugly as sin to me I, I like the smaller headstocks and but 
I don't see how you can hate this guitar. I don't get it. I think it looks great. I, I, I think too, if, I'm kind of so, meh on the looks of it, to be honest with you. Like the silver is not my color, so. Well, they're coming out with what a white, black, silver. Um, I think those are the main colors right now: white, black, and silver. So that's where I'm a little bummed because uh, when he came out with the like he debuted this like a year ago when he was on tour. It was a green one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was blue. Oh, okay. And hmm. my first guitar was a blue Strat, so there's a soft spot in my heart for those. And uh, hmm. I don't know. I I was a little disappointed they didn't do the blue, but yeah. yeah. Well, I think I... more colors, I would be slightly more interested, especially if it was like super good quality and played really well. Hmm. Okay, hold on. I'm, I want to look at the colors because there's a there's quite a few. So there's right. Onyx, yeah. which is black, Horizon, which is the red, there's Tungsten, which is, I guess, the silver steel, mm -hmm. and then there's a white one. I mean, that's a pretty decent amount of colors, I mean, I'd say. Yeah. I, I think you're just missing the really obvious one for a Strat, which is a three-tone sunburst. <sighs> that's the ugliest color a Strat could ever be. <laughs> Throw a torque guard on it, and it's heaven. Get out of here. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I won't agree with you on that, dude. <laughs> no, uh, but there is a John Mayer black one copy for seventeen hundred on eBay, by the way, right now. Copy. Uh, well, it says I'm saying it's a copy. I'm not. I mean, do you really want me to scroll through eBay right now while we're recording? No, we're not that kind of podcast. So, um, I'm on Reverb looking at a John Mayer one. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we should have a we should have like a bet on who's going to end up with a John Mayer uh, guitar first. Besides, well, yeah, Scott's I already lost already. that contest. Like, well, no, eight no, no, years no, no. <laughs> no, 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 We're not, we won't count that one towards it. Oh, okay, but uh, let's see. I'll have to send you the link. Though. I'll put it in the group message. There's 199 people watching, sir. Um, but all right, so. Let's see, did anyone else have anything else they wanted to say about the PRS uh, John Mayer Strat besides the fact that it's beautiful and I want one? <laughs> I, I'm not sure about the fretboard radius on it. What is the fretboard radius? It's seven uh, and a quarter. Yep. Yep. Super vintage. Yeah, I'm sure it plays fine. If it's good enough for John Mayer, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, here's one thing I do want to know. Does it, I wonder if he's actually playing with, like, you know how most players don't actually play with the one from their actual line? Mm -hmm. I wonder if he actually is playing, like, with just a standard $2,300 guitar. Or if they made him a custom one that is a little different. Because that's one thing, like, Brad Paisley, that came out with the Signature Telly last year. And one of the things is, is he plays it stock. Besides that, he adds a, B, a G bender to it. So I wonder if John Mayer is playing a stock one. Mm. So Scott, if you could call him, oh, and yeah. get him on the show. Yeah, I'm I'm texting him now, and we'll uh, yeah. we'll see what he gets back to me with. Since you are an industry professional, industry adjacent, so. <laughs> industry adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, last year, last year at, at Nam or Summer Nam, we're all like finding ways to get in. <clears throat> Chris and Marissa got in from their podcast they did uh, and their website, and then Scott, you got in from your work though, didn't you? Uh, I was offered like I applied for it, and I just didn't get around to finishing the application because. Uh, oh, that's right. You got in through Daniel Shields too, didn't I did. you? Okay. Yeah, but you were actually there. You're like, oh, I actually got to do like, I got like, there's some work stuff, and like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what? Yeah, I was like, I thought Nam was just a cool yeah. place to hang out. Yeah, I was, I was on the whole other half of the hall, checking out speakers and microphones and that kind of stuff. I was just, if if this year, if you hear a random tuba being played pretty loud, <laughs> you you found me. And... So if anyone actually listens to this and they're at Summer Nam, you hear a tuba. You're welcome. And that's the story of how Diaz gets Namthrax. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, don't put your mouth on the instrument. The yeah. only other person who's done that was a kid over there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I we were going to do it at the beginning, and we totally forgot. We kind of jumped in. So yeah. 
what's new in the in everyone's kind of gear world chris uh the newest thing i have gotten lately has been the tc electronics uh tube pilot the uh smorgasbord gatone line yeah. that has the uh it actually has a tube in it yeah 50 bucks i didn't know that 50 bucks and it has a tube wow that's like half the price right there it seems like probably especially when you consider the what would be the next popular one like the butler tube driver or whatever it is you see a pedal with tubes in it yeah those are like 125 used for like the super older model. So, I mean, considering for a brand new something with a tube in it, I'd say that's pretty fair. There is, I can't remember what it was. There's always one pedal, like right when I first started playing, and I was like, I was like, oh, that thing lights up. That's cool as crap. Uh, it, it's kind of had a British look to it. I think it might have been an EHX pedal or something. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Or was that that dream I had? I don't remember that one. Cricket, crickets chirping. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know like some like the Vought, like early Vought, not super early, but like two thousands Vox pedals had like a fake tube in it that lit up. Man, that'll like crush my childhood dream if that actually was fake. Oh, I mean, a lot of them weren't like driving the tube hard enough to actually be meaningful. A lot of them were just. Stuck an LED under it. Yeah. Or they were just using the tube as a buffer. I mean, instead of like actually like getting clipping off the the tube. Yeah, it might have been. Let's see. I'm looking. I was looking it up. Oh, there it is. It was Electro Harmonics English Muffin Tough something. Oh yeah, that had like the two tubes and like see? a big like rounded grill. Yeah. Thing. Like a metal grill. That wasn't that appealing, but... Huh. There's one for a hundred bucks. I might have to buy one at some point. So in my, in my Googling here, I found the Behringer VT999 Vintage Tube Monster. Wonder, oh, yes. wonder how similar that yeah. is to what you just got there, Chris. Uh, let me jump on Reverb and maybe just, I can pick it up. They're 50 bucks new. Yeah, on Sweetwater over here. Jeez. And you'll have it in three days or less. Wait, what'd you say the model of it was? VT999. Has a noise gate built in? Oh. It's very true. <laughs> it would need it. Because my one complaint about it yet, and I'll probably talk about this more in the demo that I do of it, is it's only gain and volume. So you're stuck with whatever treble bass mids that is pre in there or in my case i have a preamp in front of it but i can't push that much more of treble without making my clean sound just ice picky harsh yeah you should yeah, you you should get this and, and do a side by side because i'm guessing it's based off this or close to it because since behringer and tc electronics are i mean the smorgasbord is pretty much what's happened to behringer it seems yeah. like that's what I'm thinking too. This one actually has a three band EQ. So and a noise gate. Let's see. The MSR the MSRP on it's seven seventy four ninety nine. So let's see. I still think you should try that one out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who's next? Marissa, anything new going on with you? How's that bass coming? <laughs> it's coming. Um, just pay to get more coding put on it. Hmm. It'll be done soon, right? I think so. Yeah, because I think he's uh, we had a local builder, uh, Killer B, Killer B Guitars, do the clear coat for us, and he said it like was just soaking in the clear coat, so we had to like basically pay him parts for another like five gallon 20 gallon whatever it is like bucket of isn't killer b guitars pretty well known yeah yeah they, well, i think i had a friend who had a telly made by them but yeah huh. or a t style 
following. Yeah, I'm really tempted to get like a Les Paul done by them because he just started doing some models like that and uh, like acoustic shaped like a Les Paul. Hmm. So with hmm. my whole like Green Day cover band thing, that would just fit perfectly. Oh uh, yeah, you've got the Green Day cover band. So are you guys doing? Tri- is it a tribute band or a cover band? Uh, we're shooting. Well, I'm hoping to shoot for like tribute status because that's like where the more money and more gigs come from. But at the same time, with my work being second shift, that kind of limits my playing ability. Yeah. I don't want to like waste PTO on gigs, but oh well. Okay, Scott, we're uh, what's going new with you? Well, I I broke my project lockdown a few weeks ago. Um, I still don't have the pedal in hand, but I put a pre-order in for the wrought iron effects Kyber. Oh, yeah. Really um, looking forward to finally, you know, finishing that payment and uh, getting that in hand. I'm, it should be pretty fun. Yeah, I saw that. I, w- I really wanted one. I messaged Ed and was trying to get like information on how like how long it was selling for and all that and it just didn't work out but they but look exactly is it It like based on it's... the controls it looks like a fuzz and drive mix or is it just strictly a fuzz it's a so fuzz i think in drive and it has basically a tremolo circuit that's a bias instead of like the normal way a tremolo works is it just it's usually like an amplifier that just cuts in and out right and gives you that in and out sound uh this has a glitchy kind of hard shifting on the fuzz's bias so it kind of gives you that light lightsabery jittery thing so it should be pretty cool and they just look amazing ed yeah. makes like some beautiful looking stuff yeah i'm i'm really excited this is my first thing from ed finally uh i've been kind of holding off meaning to get something from him for a while because i everything he makes is beautiful I've got two straps that I had made by him and I need to get a third one, but, uh, he, I like his line of pedal. His, he does a lot of rehousing too. And, mm-hmm. but his rehouses get crazy. Like not like, not like in a bad way, crazy, but like just in one of those, like you look at it and you're like, how the heck did he even think of this? <laughs> but he makes killer sounding stuff though. I, I what was the the Orchrist or Orchist or yeah. that's the one that has the blade from the Hobbit. Yeah, it has Sting from Lord of the Rings. That's it. Yeah, it's that's killer. So then I was so I was upset because like I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, so I missed out on that fuzz. But he said I think. Uh, I'm hoping at some point he like will release some of them again, but wishful thinking. And then, oh wait, now it's my turn. New stuff for me is actually podcast related. I got um, a set of Lambertone pickups in. Uh, they are sponsoring this episode. Um, they're called uh, the ones I got were called the Crema. They are a PAF style um, humbucker set. And uh, it's really cool because on the website, you can pick if you want. Um, they've got, you know, you can do polished uh, and then like the brass and you can do like an unpolished, like kind of rough looking, I guess you'd say more of a relic look. And you can actually get it where it's a flat cover instead of pole pieces showing. So, which I did that because I, I mean, everyone's got a one with pole pieces on it but whenever you see one without it you kind of like you're like oh what's that in there so i got those i played those today in service and uh they sounded amazing so i'm coming from pickups that sound close to it the 57 classics but the uh something about the cremas they the neck pickups just amazing and the uh the bridge pickup so usually I'd have to sit there and, and I'd dial in my drives to kind of match what I'm playing with um, for the most of the service. And But I just stuck with what I had and it sounded phenomenal. So he was, they're pretty good. I mean, um, the uh, whole set's 350, which for boutique uh, pickups, 
it isn't a horrible price. So I think it's more on the high end, though. Is it? What's what? What does a set of porters cost? Uh, I want to say they're about two fifty. Two fifty for a whole set. Yeah, I'm confirming that real quick. Because uh, I know like fit, fifty seven classics. Yeah, fair, fifty seven classics from Gibson are one hundred fifty each. So. Yeah, uh, a single humbucker from Porter is one fifteen. That's like steamer dumping prices. Yeah, and a set is two fifty. Jeez. Which I mean that that price isn't totally out there because I think if you get into like some of the creamery pickups, I mean, granted yeah. that's like having to ship from the UK. I think is where they're based, so you gotta take that into account. And also, uh, this guy I follow, he's in Pedal Boards of Doom. I don't remember what this company is called, but he's kind of on the higher end, too. Well, I think when you get a lot of these newer companies, they've, they've really got a set. Because uh, they're, they're a newer company. I think they just started at the beginning of this year. And yeah. you really have to set your market by your price. I mean, because you, you can always go down in price, but you don't want to start going up. Um, that's whenever you start losing customers instead of gaining them. But yeah. uh, you also got to think some of the pickup companies that we've listed have gone from like one man shop to having at least two or three people. In yeah, and I mean able to cut down on prices because I remember back when Brian started Porter, I think a single humbucker, I think I paid one fifty, one seventy five. Yeah, and now they're all the way down to one fifteen. But you know Brian pretty well, don't you? Didn't you take lessons from him? Yeah, he's the one who originally starred me in guitar. Oh, so <laughs> someone's got friends in high places. <laughs> also, good friends with uh, John Snyder from Creation. <laughs> yeah, I know John too. Yeah, but do you have a two every year with him? No, but I do get a nice hug. <laughs> <laughs> he said hi to me <laughs> once. <laughs> he said hi. <laughs> Actually, I, I have a shipment from John coming my way here. I'm looking forward to that too. What? Do you, oh, I think that should be. Uh, should we wait? And you can use that as a what's new, or are you going to tease it? Uh, you know, it's not for me. And, you know, shout out to John of just how good of a guy he is. He had a couple sets of those uh, gear supply. <laughs> uh, a former. <laughs> uh, I know. Censoring the. <laughs> uh, those who shall not be named um, string and accessories kits. And uh, he let me actually buy three of them. Um, just to give out to some of the other guitar players in my church. It's kind of a, hey, thanks for, you know, putting in extra services this month because it's pretty, it's going to be a pretty crazy schedule, especially Good Friday. Yeah, because he had a limit. And... He had a limit of one per person, didn't he, on that? Uh, I didn't see it anywhere stated, so I put in three, and then he was like, hang on, Scott, you can't buy three, and he was going to return my two cents or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and then he found out what I was doing with him, and so I'm, you know, he's like, "Here, have the three So you know, really nice guy. Um, yeah, he's cool with stuff like that. I remember because uh, I picked up uh, one of my my second creation board from him last year at, at Summer Nam, and I finally got something put on that board. I finally moved it over after being lazy for almost a year, and. Uh, he was re he was really cool because he he just didn't want to bring the stuff home. And you're if anyone from Nam is listening, he didn't sell it to me because you're not allowed to do that. Mm. But he did he he did let me walk out with with that in the bag, so that was pretty cool. I I also bought something at Nam last year. So I bought the earplugs that you t I think you told us about them, didn't you? Oh yeah, those are, those are good ones. Yeah, and I also got a uh, we met. Uh, Kurt over at Classic Audio Effects. I bought something off him. Oh yeah, that's right. I bought a, um, a Foothills volume from him shortly after that and yeah. sold it. But yeah, he sent me the uh, Space Cadet before it came out. Oh, uh, did you get to demo that? Yeah, it's on or... uh, Carter Stock Tone YouTube. 
Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> so, let's see. And then we were going to talk about, we had like a, a little mini conversation we were going to have on, uh, what were we, what was it called? What were we going to call it, Scott? Practice rigs. Practice rigs, that's it. Yeah. So, Scott, since you started that on uh, the Instagram, won't you uh, lead off? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, an, a topic I thought I'd bring up is uh, we obviously sit and obsess over our oversized pedal boards and loud amps and all that kind of stuff. But when you're home, what are you using to practice? Are you using that and going deaf or are you doing something different? Well, what were you doing? Because you, yours was quite interesting compared to what I think most people will use. Uh, yeah. So, like, at, I was practicing for church this Sunday, uh, and we use Planning Center pretty excessively. So, I will get, you know, full tracks and full layouts, and we'll have our practice tracks in there, too, because we use backing tracks with a click. And uh, so, I will, I'll actually be playing that over my studio monitors, and instead of trying to get an amp balanced and and deal with all that i just run a an amp emulator in a daw and for those who don't call it daws i run it in pro tools um <laughs> something simple like that and it lets me just kind of level balance everything so like i can i can do my like all right guitar 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 way over the mix kind of thing and then yeah. i can also like back myself down to the point where like I'm sitting in a normal mix and I can hear it that way too and try to figure it out. So, and I don't tick off the neighbors. So do you run your pedal board at all through that or, uh, sometimes I, ever since I even got an even bigger pedal board and also just simply I'm playing at church like every week now. So I really just kind of leave my performance gear just packed up. I don't, yeah. I don't really want to haul all that out, set up multiple cables, and then I kind of lose my desk space around where I also work. So, yeah, just plug straight in. I'm not fiddling with any pedals. I'm just working on the part. That's cool. Chris, Marissa, what do you guys do to, for uh, practice? Um, well, it really depends on the situation. Like, when I'm practicing for St. Jimmy uh all when i had my plexi i would just suck it up and go deaf but that was also like i just got it and i was trying to get sounds mixed in um but when i'm not since i can't do that anymore i'm kind of like scott where instead of like having to plug up everything to practice i'll just grab my little eye rig and plug it into my ipad and sometimes Didn't you I'll... have a line six uh rack unit i had a pod but my only thing with like that and it's the same with the marshall preamp that i have is the headphone like whatever i don't know if it's like just the way it's coming through the headphones or if it's like my headphones in general but it sounds like it's coming through a little like eight inch speaker hmm. Hmm. That's my like only gripe with doing those, and that's part of why like I just sucked it up and practiced with everything, you know, out loud going. But yeah, I've gotten a little used to practicing with the iPad because, like Scott, I play at church too, and for whatever reason, we don't get all the backing tracks, so I kind of don't know what's going on until we get there, but. I'll just have like the song going and then mix in slightly over the mix. That way I can figure out my part and see how it kind of sounds with everything. Hmm. Marissa, do you ever practice? Or do you just show? Do you just kick butt? <laughs> I practice. I don't play anywhere, but I'll sit around and I'll either I'll plug into Chris's pedal board or I'll just play to myself. Oh my when are you going to make Chris buy you a pedal board and be like, build your own stuff? And she has my old, well, we have my old creation. And then I have my little janky 
U2, like, plywood pedal board. That's, that's when the FedEx guy shows up and Chris is all excited. He's like, oh, a pedal. Boom. No, she knocks you over, takes it. She's, <laughs> that's it. Dominance. What did you almost take from me recently that I got? Your ARP 87. Oh, yeah. She got Do you have from... an ARP 87? Yes, and I actually sold my Pink Panther recently. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> So what, uh, seven, so. <laughs> on Scott, weren't you looking for uh, a delay at NAM too? I know Chris was. Oh yeah, like that was all I was about at Summer NAM last year. Was all about the new delays coming out, and so like we were all having. I think it was when we went to a Hot Chicken. We were all talking about, you know, what was the winning delay of NAM because Chris was Team Pink Panther and I was ARP eighty seven, and so. I didn't even have a dog in the fight. I didn't care at that point. I had my timeline at that point, so I was good. Oh, yeah, you were just trifecta. Yeah. I did. I had the holy trinity of, tri- of Strymon pedals, but no, I have none of those anymore. Well, and the sad part for me is I didn't wind up buying either either. Uh, you've got the DL4. Is that your main delay right now? Uh, I also got my hands on a tonal recall. <sighs> nice. That I read now. So I... <sighs> Between that and the mods I did to the DL4, I'm quite happy with my delay situation right now. Yeah, that sounds like a killer delay section. So, but so, uh, man, I got high of the ARP 87, and I, man, I did not gel with it at all. I had it for like less than 24 hours, and it was sold. Wow. It was like like one of those like you meet a girl, and yeah, you might grow to love her, but like that first instinct is like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. That's what I had with ARP 87. So, <laughs> I think that's how just... I felt about the King of Tone. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. But uh, hold on, before we get distracted, I'll go with mine, <laughs> how I rec- how I practice, because we're going on a tangent. Yeah. So my practice is really awesome. I use my Kemper, and now I have to take a drink because I said the word Kemper. Oh. Um that's your one for the the episode oh i get one one kemper <laughs> so uh-huh. no I've, I've actually got a really good setup for my for my practice um for the most part my pedal board stays packed up um unless i plan on changing stuff uh like i've got the source audio uh nemesis that's what i'm using for delay so if i want to set up a new delay or something um i'll pull it out but for the most part i just use my kemper for practice i've got a spot set up on my desk with the cables already uh, kind of drilled into place where all I have to do is plug it in and I run through my studio monitors which those actually suck I need to get new studio monitors soon but um, that's pretty much my practice um, we use planning center but we don't run tracks we just run a click because um, we we're more of a like Pentecostal southern Pentecostal spontaneous thing um, and we're not like one of those churches that like oh, no, no, this is our spontaneous time right here because <laughs> it kind of defeats the purpose of spontaneity. But um, <laughs> I've never understood planned spontaneity. But uh, so we all, the only thing we use live is we'll run click and we run pads. But we're really the uh, the weirdest, not the weirdest church, but um, we've got a real solid set of musicians. So we change keys quite often too. So we'll be in service or not. Like, we'll be like right before service and we'll be like, no, we're doing this in, in B flat. And then right before service, we're like, ah, actually we're going to kick it down to G and this person's going to sing lead. And the whole band just kind of moves there and knows what they're doing. So do you guys run on Nashville numbers then instead of actually playing oh, yeah. the board sheets? Well, we use, um, we use the chord sheets in planning center. We don't, no one prints anything out. We've got all iPads mm-hmm. and, um, if we need to change a key, we can do it really quick in there. But if we're going and doing something spontaneous, uh, like today, I think we tra- we like transitioned into two different songs that we all know, but we we didn't practice for. Um, we uh, we use the number system if anyone gets lost. So uh, today was my director that oh, called out. Like yeah, we use we use the talkback mic. Um, sometimes we don't utilize it as much but uh pretty much kind of the rule of thumb is at our church is if you're leading worship you have to be able to be a director as well so um if you watch our live stream 
by any chance. Um, what you'll see is sometimes they're running numbers down by with their left hand where the musicians are. So whoever's leading the actual song, they're singing lead and they're doing numbers. So we've really kind of uh, put a lot on our musicians and our singers. They, you know, you don't just get up there and sing. You have to know something about music and you have to, um, and that's like one of the toughest things I've seen is you get into these churches where the person leading worship knows nothing about music, but they want to like tell the musicians what to do. And there's kind of like a riff there, but at our church, it doesn't happen that way. So I've had to like pull executive decisions when people have like asked me to come in and then they have like somebody that's like barely led worship and it's like, um, okay, that that's not the best way to do this. Let's try it this way because well, that's how everybody does it. <laughs> The heart, I mean, the worst is like whenever you get someone in there and they're just like, something doesn't sound right. And you're you're all just like looking at each other like, well, what doesn't sound right? They're, I need more of something. I can't tell you what it is. It's like, well, how do you expect us to do this yeah. if you can't tell us what it is? Like the people who we have leading right now um, uh, are the, they're, it's two brothers. They're actually our pastor's sons. And I mean, they, they're all amazing musicians. Um and they'll, they'll sit there, they'll be like, listen, I need you to back off of this or, you know, bring this up or something. And and they can really communicate, which is oh, one of the hardest things I've seen, because we've gotten into a time where people just let anyone, if, if they feel that they've got the heart for worship, it's like, oh, here's the mic, let's go. And it's just like, that's not always the best option. <laughs> yeah. So, so, like, we're we're way different. We're, the, the band I'm playing with mostly is... Uh very track centric very pre-planning centric so yeah. like, everything is very regimented before we even show up um, yeah, because we're fair. we're a multi-campus church and so we're sharing pastors and so like if you're missing your times by two three minutes you know the pastor's going to be late at the other campus for the other service so like that puts a lot of emphasis on us like pre-planning you know your parts when you show up and like that's practice is just so important in that role and also we yeah, don't that's, i mean we don't rehearse either like we just show up the day of set up do no. one run through and we're playing so that that i respect that a lot because we, we don't do that like um i'm the i'm the main lead guitarist at my church and for the most part i listen to the songs and i kind of i'll take the lead lines and i'll play them pretty spot pretty close but I'll, I mean, we're going to change the key and everything. So, you know, you kind of move it around because there's some lead lines. Like if you need to bring it from a G to a, to a C, it's just not going to sound right. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like too high or too low. So you kind of have to find a middle ground. But if you put me into a church where they're like, you have to show up and you have to know everything right away. Oh no, I'm, I'm scared to death. I was like, <laughs> I, I'm totally going to be that guy that's like sitting back, just like shaking his head. Like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm playing for real. I promise. So <laughs> that's, that's a whole nother level of musicianship right there though, too. I think it's like, it's totally different though. I think they should like do like swapping, like how they do like the wife swap and stuff like that and swap musicians. Scott, you can come to my spontaneous church where nothing's planned out, and I'll go to yours, and we'll, we'll both just stare at each other and be like, I don't know how you do it. You, you can just watch the steam come out of my ears because I'm super type A. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm over here just like, like, oh, no, 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 this is great. This is great. It's, like, it's burning down around me. Well, this is awesome. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. We have we have people in our, in our community that are that way, too, and that's the way they lead, and you know, they'll show up the day of and they'll go, eh, 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 and they haven't really looked at anything and stuff like that. It's just the one guy I play with mostly, uh, the way he leads, he's like, show up prepared. This is what you do. You know, it, it, it's not a slave driver kind of relationship. Like I love this guy to death and that's why I love playing with him. It's just one of those, like, you know, here's the bar, come up and meet it, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. good to make sure. All right. Well, I think I think that's a, a pretty good stopping point for us. All right. And for the effects loop, this is Diaz, Chris, Marissa, and Scott. All right. We'll see you guys next time.